Paul is talking about receiving one who is weak in the faith. He says, receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to dispute over doubtful things. First verse is asking us to receive one who is weak in the faith. The word receive, if you look it up in the Greek, means to take to, to take into your heart or, or house. In other words, uh, let this person come close to you. Let this person be your friend. Receive one who is weak in the faith, meaning someone who might be bound up in legalism, someone that is fearful or, or uncertain about what they are to do or how they're to live as Christians. That is the person that Paul is, is <coughs> focusing on as the person who is weak. It doesn't mean that the person is a weak person in character. It means that they're weak in faith. The weakness in faith oftentimes looks like or appears as someone who is super strong, very opinionated, egotistical, oftentimes uh, overbearing and a know-it-all. Usually people that are always telling other people what to do and always telling people how to think are people that are oftentimes weak in faith. And, and what I found a lot of times is that when people are really hard on other people, they must have a weakness in kind of the same area that that person has. Otherwise, they wouldn't harp on it so much. They wouldn't be so strong about it. And, and case in point, you've seen it throughout the years where someone will be railing on, uh, one pastor will be railing on another pastor, saying that the person should leave the pulpit, the person should get out of the pulpit because they have no business being there, because yada, yada, yada. And then it turns out that that person's doing something much worse. And that's the reason why that person, even maybe unconsciously, is so condemned or convicted themselves that they feel like they have to, to bring this other person down. They won't come out and repent themselves. This is part of the dirt of the ministry, part of the dirt of, of being in the ministry, and, and the ministry does burn people out if they're not ready for it. If you're ready for the fact that ministers and people in ministry, both men and women, are seriously, or just as seriously flawed as you and I, then we are capable of working together with people body together with people to do the work of God together. But if you come in thinking that everything is going to be just perfect, everything's going to be fine, uh, people are going to actually be biblical uh, in their actions and the way that they react and the way that they, they uh, deal with problems and situations. If you come in thinking about like that, about all the church, you'll be stumbled like crazy. And I know a lot of people that have left the ministry and some of them are even uh, claim to be agnostic now. They say, I don't even know if I believe it anymore. Because of what they saw in the ministry, what they saw coming out of people that were really actually highly anointed by God. This is something I like to share with people, uh, especially young ministers, is that you are going to meet people that are very anointed. They're, they're going to blow your mind with the, the abilities that God has given them. They, are, they, they shine sometimes like the sun. They shine like, like the Lord. But they can be extremely carnal when they're not like that. When the, when the Spirit of the Lord is not on them, when they're not under the anointing of God, they can be horrible people to be around. And it shouldn't be that way, but it seems to be that way, which showed me early on that God looks at things, uh, the way that he looks at things is he will give someone and he will not take away those gifts or calling. And if that person starts to go into sin, he will deal with the sin, but he won't take away the gifts. So a lot of times I would meet people that had extremely powerful spiritual gifts, prophetic gifts, and word of knowledge, and word of wisdom, and uh, praying for people and seeing them healed, and, uh, and having dreams and visions and, and with great accuracy. But on the other side of it, they would be carnal, and I'd find out about their their uh, immorality and things like that. And it puzzled me at first until I started to realize that God uses vessels. And if the vessels are faithful and if, if they are open to God, he will use them. And if they sin, he will uh, chase them down, but he doesn't take away their gifts. And that's why you see people who uh, have powerful gifts of evangelism and teaching and uh, and other things like that, that also uh, you find out that they, they've had affairs or they've been immoral or they've taken money from the church. 
but it doesn't take away the other part of, of what's going on. So what we have to remember all the time is that, that people, um, people can be anointed and yet still really be carnal. People can be uh, uh, people that really God uses to do things, but they can be weak in the faith. They're people that, that are weak in the faith because they judge other people based on their own convictions. So oftentimes this translates into what they believe other Christians should do or how they should live, or which leads up to a judgment of others. Verse 2 takes us into an example. It says, For one believes he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. Let not him who eats despise him who does not eat. Let him who does not eat judge him who eats, for God has received them. This is easy enough. Two people have different convictions uh, of what they may or may not eat. One, one eats all things, the other is a vegan. Each is convinced that the particular diet is appropriate. Who is correct? And the answer is both are. Both are because before God, it's, it, either conviction is appropriate before God as long as it's not something that is uh, <coughs> biblically sinful or a deviation from what God is doing. Both are according to their personal convictions. Uh, the person who eats everything might see the vegan as being weak or wimpy. The vegan might see the meat eater as a barbaric carnivore. But neither should judge the other because God has what? That same word, receive them both. He has taken them both in. He has embraced both. So now you, you start to see that Paul, even probably unconsciously through the Spirit, is already building a case for this, for love within the brethren. He says, who are you to judge another servant, in verse 4? To his own master he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. This is really a, a, a verse to, to memorize, too. This is something we learn from the Bible and from the Spirit of God, is not to judge one another, even if a person seems to warn it. There are a lot of times I think that I have, in the past, justified my judgment because my judgment was correct and true. But on the other hand, as I'm reading the scriptures, God is saying, you don't have the right to judge that person, even if the person is guilty. It's not for you. It's for me to do, and for you to love that person. This becomes the, the, uh, the walk, is where I, we, we are given the ability to see things and know things and understand things, and then God shows us what to do with things, all bathed in love and compassion and grace and mercy. It's not so that we will know things about people so that we can condemn them or convict them or do anything to them. So if God gives you a word of knowledge, a lot of people are given the word of knowledge where you you just suddenly know something about someone. No one has told you anything about them. You just know it. And so what do you do with that knowledge? A lot of times it happens when you're praying for someone or praying with someone. God will give you a word of knowledge concerning that person's life. Or something that the person is going through. And you may even say it. You know, the Lord is showing you this. But what he wants you to do with that information is always for the, the purpose of edification. To bring that person closer. Otherwise, he wouldn't have even have shown you what he showed you. Or let you say what you said. Because the gifts of the Holy Spirit are for the edification of the church. It's not to judge. It's not to, to uh, become higher or more powerful than your peers the other people, it is to serve the body of Christ. It is to edify the body of Christ. <clears throat> so every gift that, that edifies the body of Christ, as we see them listed in Scripture, and as we begin to exercise them, is always for the edification of the body, except for one. And it still edifies the body, and that's the gift of tongues. The gift of tongues is the only gift that God has given to us that is for self-edification, where you can Pray in the Spirit and edify and build yourself up immediately by speaking in your in your prayer language. Groanings that cannot be uttered. So there is something that we learn from the Bible, from the Spirit of God, and that is not to judge one another, even if a person warrants it or deserves it. This doesn't mean that we are to not deal, though, with harmful sin in the body of Christ, or to not be lovingly confrontational with our brothers and sisters when it warrants it when they're going astray. This, to me, is more loving than just leaving someone alone as they're, as they're walking toward the edge of a cliff and not to fall over. It's better to, 
to, to grab them and have them hate you and try to divert them from destruction than it is to let them grow. But I think that as time goes on, we start to get, we start to become islands. Uh, you know, in the early days of Calvary, a lot of us lived in communes and we bonded and we, we uh, sandpapered each other and we, we beat each other up and we hugged each other to death and it was this beautiful camaraderie. And then after the commune days, everyone wanted privacy, so they started to kind of pull back and everyone got into their own individual lives and people got married and had kids. And pretty soon you had a lot of separate people that would come together once or twice a week and say hello to each other and it just became more and more separate as time went on. Now there's no way that we can live communally and stay communal, but the one thing that we can do and exercise is is true koinonia, where we come together and rather than just socializing, we, we actually get down with fellowship, pray with one another, care about one another, take an interest in one another's lives and the both the woes and the elations of our brothers and sisters. So we could weep with those who weep and mourn with those who mourn, but rejoice with those who rejoice. So the more loving thing to do is to bring people back. You know, when we talk about uh, when you remember someone, you, you remember that they are not with, walking with the Lord, but they go to church, they immediately start to pray for them. And immediately start to find ways to reach them and find them so that we can bring them back into the fold of God. Because there are a lot of people out there right now that feel like they can't come back. That they have been ostracized or straight armed away from the body of Christ. Some people might say, well, they deserve it because they blew it really bad. They hurt people. They, they, uh, they gave the, the Church of Jesus Christ a black eye. Although you can't give Jesus a black eye, you can, you can hurt the, the reputation of Christianity by your behavior, especially if a lot of people do think we're Christians. But that doesn't mean that we are not to love them as family and go out and rescue them from even their own uh, wanderings. As they're out wandering, as prodigals out in the wilderness, you want to go out and find them and bring them back. And the way that we do that is to not judge them, to, to not even, unless they want to get into it, not even get back into the things that happened in the past, but just go, come on, come back into fellowship. Come and hang out. You know, you, you are more than received. I have friends that are so ashamed that they write me and they say, do you think that I could come to your church? Do you think, do you think that it's okay for me to come? And I go, of course it's okay for you to come. They go, well, I, I don't know. I'm really uncomfortable now because I've been away from God for a long time. I said, more than more than better reason. What greater reason for you to come back? And, and, and you, I, I promise you, at our church, you won't be judged because our, our church is filled with agape. Our church is filled with love. If there are people that are judgmental and, and people that are critical, they soon change because it, it becomes infectious in, in, in a manner of speaking, to, to be amongst people that are gracious, people that are merciful, people that look beyond uh, your, your, your faults and your blemishes. You know, looking at someone and realizing that sometimes blemishes are just the smallest part of a person's face. You never even notice them. They, they think everyone sees my blemish. Everyone's looking at my, my pimple. You know? But no one's looking at your pimple, they're looking at your whole face. And that's what we do, is we learn to look at the whole person and draw that person back in. So Paul's referring to things which are not black or white or even gray. They are personal convictions about ordinary things in everyday life. And it's amazing the diversity of things Christians argue about and divide over. So Paul is addressing these things. He goes on to say in verse 5, One person esteems one day above another, and another esteems every day of life. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it to the Lord. He who does not observe the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. He who eats, eats to the Lord, for he gives God thanks. And he who does not eat to the Lord, he does not eat and gives God thanks. But none of us lives to himself and no one dies to himself. If we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord. Whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. For to this end Christ died and rose and lived again, that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. So I think Paul was using the idea of making certain days special as an overall principle. But he could have 
had in mind the arguments concerning the way that people celebrate the Sabbath, the day when we are to rest in our labors and spend time with the Lord. Now we know that most Christians use Sunday as the day of rest and to seek the Lord. If you're legalistic about it and you hear about someone having a Sabbath on a different day, you may think that they're off. Well, that's not right. We all know that it's supposed to be Sunday. But I know that there are, there are places uh, like Surfer Chapel, for example, in Huntington Beach. They have their, their chapel service on a Saturday night so they can wake up on Sunday and go surfing. <clears throat> and yet these people love the Lord just as much as anybody else. But yet other people look at them and say, well, they're wrong because they should be, uh, they should be fasting from surfing and spend the day, all day Sunday like the rest of us worshiping God. So most Christians use Sunday as the day of rest, but others choose Saturday. A person may work on Sunday and use another day of the week to spend with the Lord. Is that person incorrect? A lot of people would argue that he or she is, but the principle is that there should be no judgment from anyone concerning the specialties of days, or the days that are chosen. There are a lot of places probably in uh, China and communist countries where they can't get together on a Sunday, can't get together on what other people or other Christians see as the Sabbath. But you can make any day your Sabbath, and you can make any place your chapel. I used to tell people, hey, the way that I found is if you can find like a really great tree stump in the forest and say, God, I will meet you at this stump every day, he will meet you there. And I guarantee that he will meet you there. And people have come back to me and said, I have my own special tree stump. I go out there and I sit with the Lord and the place is anointed. And as soon as I'm there, it's about all the ground is holy. It's almost like you can feel angels and and the heavenly uh, action all around every time I get to that tree stump. But it's just a tree stump, isn't it? It's just a day, isn't it? It's just food, isn't it? It's just meat or, or uh, a lack of meat. This is what Paul is trying to get to. He's trying to show the, the, the spiritual side of things because everything that we do here in the material or in, on, on the worldly sense or on the earthly plane is just really something that will ultimately is ultimately just a shadow of the things that we're going to see in the kingdom of heaven. So the kingdom of heaven is too mind-boggling for us to even comprehend. And we have never experienced it, but God gives us glimpses of what it's going to be like in the kingdom of heaven. We were talking a little bit earlier about, uh, Shirley and I were talking about, uh, should we take things literally in the Bible? Some people don't take them literally, but it could be that everything is exactly literal. That that there are uh, that uh, when Jesus comes back and he uh, and he speaks, it'll be like a, a a flame of fire coming from his mouth. Now, I would say, as a logical person, that that is symbolic of like a sword, or a sword, a fiery sword coming forth from his mouth. That when he speaks, just as God spoke the universe into existence and the, the word of God is will be coming back to judge the nations and everything. That when he speaks, it is his words that have the authority, and the power, because the whole universe was created by the word of God, or through the word of God. But other people might literally think that there is a sword coming out of, the, out of his mouth. And there might be, there might very well be. I mean, when we think about it, the sky's the limit. I was saying Sunday morning that I don't, sometimes I don't think that God really uh, meant that in heaven there's going to be streets of gold and pearly gates. What I think sometimes is what God is trying to show us is that the kingdom of heaven is so vastly greater than the kingdoms of the earth that the, the most precious things that we have here upon the earth are like concrete and, and uh, you know, wrought iron in the, in the kingdom of heaven. But it could be extremely literal and that gold really is precious to God. And when we get to heaven, he's, he's paid the whole uh, ground with gold. Gold everywhere. But then what does that do? For, in our logical mind, we think, well, then that he values it, doesn't it? If you, if you had nothing but diamonds and gold and pearly gates, and it was everywhere, and it was used for like your streets and your, your, uh, 
your signposts and your, your gates and everything like that, then how much would it really be worth? What gives gold and, and jewelry and uh, things value about the earth is the rarity. That's why uh, the diamonds are um, regulated as far as how many diamonds are, are let loose on the market because there's zillions of them. And, yeah, they're beautiful and sparkly, but they are regulated so that they overvalue. So I think when I get to the kingdom of heaven, I have no idea what he's going to look like. I know I have had glimpses of the glory of God, and they were so powerful and so great and so beautiful that it made me want to go there and not be here. And other times they were so great that I thought if I opened my eyes, that I would die. I would, I would literally explode. But this is one of those things where we, we realize that that we esteem things and we, we put uh, labels on things and we even back it up with scripture. But a lot of the things that we talk about and things that we argue about have no bearing. What really has bearing is that we love one another, we don't judge one another, and that if something is obviously um, a deviation from the truth and something that will bring people into a snare, then we step in. But I am not going to regulate something where someone meets the Lord, or how they worship the Lord, or what they eat, or what they drink, or what, for that matter, even, you know, what type of entertainment they have in their lives. That's none of my business. What is my business is when people are doing things that, that are destructive to themselves and to others around them, then I will make mention of it in conversations. But I still don't try to control my brothers and sisters. And, and threaten to lose them if they don't do a certain thing. So one person esteems one day above another, another esteems every day alike. He says, let each be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it to the Lord. He who does not observe the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. He who eats, eats to the Lord, for he gives God thanks. And he who does not eat to the Lord, he does not eat, he gives God thanks. So whatever we do, Whatever we are doing, regardless of what our convictions are, we do as unto the Lord. And people have different convictions about the things that they eat, the, the way that they spend their time. He who observes the day observes it to the Lord. He who does not observe the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. It's up to the individual before the Lord. He who eats, eats to the Lord, for he gives God thanks. And he who does not eat to the Lord, he does not eat and gives thank, God thanks. One eats and is thankful to the Lord for his meal. The other fasts doesn't eat and is thankful for his time to fast. Verse 7 says, For none of us lives to himself, and no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. We are always in the Lord. He has received us unto himself. And all these other things become very petty. For to this end Christ died and rose again, rose and lived again, that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. But why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? Where We shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. The word judge or judgment in the Greek is the word krino. In this context, it's used in a negative sense because it's used in tandem, if you look at the wordage, with showing contempt for your brother. This is where we openly, uh, either openly or secretly, condemn others. Paul asked, why do you judge your brother and show contempt for him? We shall all stand before the ju judgment seat of Christ. So why are you prejudging him before they will be evaluated and rewarded or lose rewards before the beaver seat of the Lord? For as it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God, so that each of us shall, see, uh, shall give account of himself to God. So when we die, or whether or our rapture, we're always hoping that we won't die and we get raptured. Before we enter heaven, we will bow the knee, first of all, it's a, in submission to Christ, and confess to God. Confess to God, giving an account of ourselves to Him. And whatever you don't confess, or that you don't even remember, I think will be, be brought to your remembrance. I think that that's going to be a serious judgment. Although we are, we are not going to be judged uh, and condemned. We will be judged and evaluated as to what we did in our relationship with God as we stand before God. And I think that God always takes into consideration 
the, uh, the intent of what we were doing, the intent of what we were feeling when we did what we did. I think when we stay honest before the Lord, if we stay pure hearted before God, we can make all kinds of mistakes, and he covers over them. Love covers a multitude of sins. We already know that we are cleansed, we are justified, and that none of us are going to be turned away from the kingdom of heaven, but we might suffer loss. And, and the picture that God gives us is of having uh, our, our works, like wood, hay, and stubble, burned away, but yet that person himself or herself will be saved. But I want to be able to stand before the Lord and not be ashamed of what I did with my life in the Lord. But even that, I was talking to Sam about this. You know, she was she was really concerned. She goes, "Well, I, there are so many things that that I, I know that I should do, and the things that I want to do, I don't do, and the things that I want to do, I you know, it's on and on, just like Paul's gonna, uh, as we saw with, with Paul earlier. Things that I want to do, I don't do. The things that I don't want to do, I do. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? But even our ability." To change and our ability to do what is right comes from the Lord. And so I think that we need to just kind of relax. I think we need to give up trying to tight fistedly walk these Christian walks and just spend the time with the Lord, like on a, on a daily and throughout the day basis. Before you go to sleep, just dedicate yourself to the Lord and, and you'll be fine. That's what I tell people. People go, no, that's. That's too easy. It's like, no, no, we have to make sure and keep each other in order and make sure that we're doing this. And I, you know, it's like people after a while should be whipping themselves with whips or belts because they want to make sure that they're punished for the things that they did wrong. But God didn't require that. All he required us to do was to love him. Love him with all of our heart, with all of our mind, with all of our, our strength, and to love one another. That is the commandment. Those are the commandments all hanging or suspended together. You know, the love God and love one another. Everything else comes from that. Seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, that everything else shall be added unto you. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, he says. If you've been judging one another, if you even judge yourself, as we see in, in, in Romans also, that Paul says, that, yeah, I've even learned not to judge myself. I don't even belong to myself. I belong to Christ, so it's up to Christ to judge me. I won't even judge myself because I don't know enough to even be able to judge of my own soul. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or cause to fall in our brother's way. So this is where I draw the line. If I know that I'm going to stumble someone, if I know that somebody else is stumbling someone, then it becomes an issue. This reveals that one of the things we will be judged by is if we have judged others. Jesus said, that which you do to the least of my little ones you have done to me. Verse 14 says, I know and I am convinced by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself. But to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Yet if your brother is grieved because of your food, you are no longer walking in love. Do not destroy with your food the one whom Christ died. So Paul is probably making reference primarily to the eating of foods, but it covers a vast area of different things. We know from Paul's letter to the church at Corinth that there was an issue with the eating of meat, of foods that were sacrificed to idols. One person could think that they were going to be possessed or cursed by eating something that had been laid before the feet of some idol. The other being stronger in faith knows that it's only meat and that the idol's not even real. They're just made out of uh, some sort of gold or silver or wood. There are Christian church uh, teachers that teach that objects and statues and symbols have power that can affect us as Christians. That if you have one of these symbols, or you touch one of these symbols, or one is in your house, that you are going to be cursed or haunted by demonic spirits that come from that, that item. My faith shows me that objects, statues, symbols, or any other thing made by man or worshipped as gods have absolutely no power in and of themselves. And what gives them power is us in believing that they are at power, in believing that you'll be cursed, in believing that the devil is in them. And that's why uh, I, I try to immediately put to rest 
with people the things where they go, hey, I, I just realized that in, in my room there's a, there's a pentagram. It looks like a pentagram. I'm not sure. It looks like a pentagram. It could be the Virgin Mary. It looks like a pentagram. You know, I mean, just some stain on the wall. And I just go, well, whatever it is, it doesn't have power. And, and what I like to use as an illustra illustration for people is this. Is a lot of people, especially back in the old days, they used to think that um, pentagrams and uh, satanic symbols, if they're placed in strategic areas, they can curse you and cause demons to come around you. And I just go, that's not true. What causes demons to come around you is if you believe it. They can smell fear. They can smell your faithlessness. And then they love to, for whatever reason, torment you because of the fact that you're not afraid. It's to say to people, what if it, someone lived in an apartment or a house before you and they painted pentagrams all over? Then they painted paint over the pentagrams so you couldn't see them, but they were still there. Would would say come around your house? Some people would go, oh, absolutely. And go, no, they wouldn't at all because you can't see them and you can't give them power because you're the one that has to give them power by your faith in believing that they are satanically linked and Satan's going to attack you. For it. Otherwise, if this were true that they could get you that way, witches and warlocks and uh, demon worshippers and Satan worshippers could just make all kinds of symbols and put them everywhere. Hide them everywhere. It's kind of the same way that I used to hide tracks all over the Renaissance Fair. The Renaissance Fair had these little scrolls that had a witness in them, a little ring around it. I put them in every little hole, in every little scroll hole, in every place where I thought like some, you know, dazed person walking through the Ren Fair would find it. Now what if Satan could do this? Put things all over the place and then demonize people because they were there. So you start to see the logic in this. You start to realize that nothing has power in and of itself. And God is our God. He's our bodyguard. He's the one that keeps us from being, uh, you know, destroyed by the enemy. He would love to destroy you, but he can't touch you. He's not able to. He can't even touch non-believers, really, unless they open themselves up to him. He tricks them into playing with Ouija boards or get into witchcraft or in seances, and then he can demonize them or possess them or whatever. But you and I can't be possessed. We have a stronghold within us that fills our inner being called the Holy Spirit, who is, is God in the name of Christ. He can't, he can't get you. If you believe that you'll be demonized because you've seen, touched, or tasted something evil, you'll be prey to the devils who love this sort of thing. But if you are strong in the faith and don't give these things power by your belief and faith, they are only lifeless, powerless objects and symbols and foods. So besides this, if you come into contact with a demonic spirit, you have a bodyguard, the Lord, whom you live within, and he lives within you. Verse 16 says, Therefore, do not let your good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but, the right, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by men. So he who serves God in righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit is the person who is acceptable to God and approved by men. We're approved by men because the fruit of God causes people to approve of us even if they, they are against us. They will approve of you even if they become your enemies at first because by your good works, you put to shame the things that they say about you and do to you. Therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace, and the things by which one may edify another, build up another person. And, and the, the idea is to build them up in Christ or toward Christ. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for the man who eats with offense. It is good neither to eat meat, nor drink wine, nor do anything by which your brother stumbles, or is offended, or is made weak. So what is he saying? He's saying that you may have the liberty to eat of things, of, of food offered to idols, or to drink wine, or beer, or, or something of, of, of that nature, or watch certain movies, but if it stumbles your brother, then... And, it, and, and that person has stumbled because of what you do, then we should refrain from doing that. I always pull up out of my hat 
the first example that comes to mind is when I first became a Christian and I joined the band that I was in. And we were traveling all the time. We were on the road. And I had come out of, uh, you know, heavy drugs and alcohol and all that stuff in the past. And I knew that I wasn't supposed to get drunk. But I didn't think that there was anything wrong. I had the liberty to drink Heineken beer. Because when I was in the world, I used to drink nothing but Heineken. And I loved it. You know, I thought about it. I think of that green bottle and how cold it was. And I think, yeah, Heineken. As long as I didn't drink more than one beer, I was fine. One day we were on tour, and we went out to eat with a pastor and his wife. And the band is all there. And all of the guys in the band, we all drank beer. And we ordered beer with our pizza. And I looked at the pastor and his wife, and they looked like they were going to just have a fit. They, they, they were beside themselves. They were, I don't even know how to describe what their faces showed. It wasn't anger, but it was shock, and it was shame, and it was fear, and all these things. And I just thought to myself, oh, a legalist. <laughs> I was judging them. And the Lord impressed me in my heart. You could say the Lord spoke to me because it was this strong. He said, do not stumble. Do not stumble those whom I love. And so after that, I never, I never drank again. And it wasn't because I, I felt that it was wrong to drink. But I thought, what if somebody else sees me and it stumbles them? So I just stopped drinking. It wasn't something I needed to do. I wasn't addicted to it. But I was willing to give it up because I was thinking, if I'm a minister of the gospel and I'm not preaching Jesus Christ, people know who I am. And they know me to be, or they see me as synonymous with being a servant of Jesus Christ. And it stumbles them that I drink, then I'm not going to drink. And so I stopped. Now I have a lot of other friends and a lot of other, uh, you know, there are pastors and teachers and evangelists and musicians. And they, all, they have no problem drinking wine and beer for their meals and they do it in public. I don't have that conviction. I, my conviction is I will not ever put myself into a position, if possible, to stumble my brother and sister because I'm willing to give it up. There's probably other things that I do, like run people off the road and stuff. I do think about it, though. Do you have faith? Paul asked in verse 22, have it to yourself before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats because he does not eat from faith for whatever is not from faith is sin. And what he's talking about are not blatant sins, are not biblical sins, but there are people that think if I, if I see a pentagram, I'm going to be uh, cursed. So to him or her, you know, for them to allow that to be there, it's sin. If someone eats food that has been, uh, like, you know, if you go into a Hare Krishna temple and eat prashadam, which is the food that they eat, they eat with their hands, and it's really good food, actually, you know, really good If you sat there and ate there, you, before you eat the food, you bless it to this little idol that they have inside the, the temple called Lord Prashadam, I mean, uh, Lord Jagannath. And you sit there, and I could, you know, I used to even chant it. Uh, before then, but I never believed it was not enough. I never believed it was real. But I would eat that food with the Hare Krishna so I could witness to them. And, and after a while, I started realizing that they think that I'm with them, that they're never going to come to Christ. So I stopped wearing the temple, stopped uh, eating them. But I would still always see them on the streets of Laguna, and I knew them by name, and I would hug them, and I would tell them I love them, and I'd look into their eyes and say, you know, I just wish that you knew Jesus. And then when me to go, you know, I already do know Jesus. And, and uh, so you can't get past that argument because their Jesus is a different Jesus. Their Jesus is just an avatar. Just one of the many countless manifestations of, of God. But their God, Krishna, is the supreme ultimate God. You know, and So we, we go back and forth. And the guy that I used to see all the time actually became second commander right under the master who brought Krishna consciousness into the United States. His name was uh, Nandi Kumar. And uh, just a wonderful man. I don't know where he is now. He might have left the Krishna movement and stuff like that. But these are people who, who are seeking God and they, they love God, they just don't know him. 
That's why I, I imagine there are a lot of Christians that say, well, I think there are going to be a lot of non-Christians that get saved or become, uh, are allowed to get into the kingdom of heaven because they have a faith in God and they don't come through Jesus Christ. And I know that's not true. And no matter how well meaning, no matter how wonderful they are, you can be the most wonderful person in a burning building and you can be sitting next to Hitler but you're all going to burn. Yeah. In the room, if you stand there, you have to get out the accident. The accident is Jesus. And that's what I tell them. And they go, well, I don't believe it. And I go, well, that, there's nothing I can do more than that. So I show you the door. Even if something is not sinful and you believe it is sinful, it is sin for you. That means that if you do it, it will separate you from God. It will, it, it will be so condemning, self-condemning, that you won't feel close to God because you believe that you're in sin. And it doesn't mean that we can make up our own sins and decide what is sin and what's not sin. But these are the areas that Paul is addressing in this particular chapter. Anyway, let's pray. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for your word and the instruction in your word. Pray, Lord, that you would just deepen our understanding of you and the way that it works. But overall, Lord, we take and we, we receive the message not to judge one another, not to be no laws, not to be self-righteous, not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought, but to be servants as Jesus was a servant to all and gave his life for all. May we walk in those footsteps when we, we make ourselves, place ourselves into a position of preference of others, of loving others, of edifying both the body of Christ and feeding people with the gospel of Jesus Christ into the kingdom of heaven. But may this not be done religiously or out of duty, but from the power and motivation and propulsion of God's love through the Holy Spirit, through us, in Jesus' name.